Turn your Bibles to John chapter 1, please, as we think today on what I hope can be a challenge to you of looking at some thoughts about the biography, the biography of Jesus. Lord, bless our time together as we look into your word. Blend our hearts together. May your spirit speak to us. May we go closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you, who's the most important person you've ever met? Well, we're going to talk about Jesus, that's for sure. That's what we're here for, and that's what it's all about. But uh, as far as a possibly uh, a um, celebrity or an entertainer or uh, someone of, of particular influence, somebody from sports, from politics, is it often that you get to meet somebody that's really important? Not too often. And so it's, it's really, it can be quite an amazing thing when that would happen. Perhaps when we think about that, maybe it's not so much on that level, but it's someone on more of a personal level that has been very helpful or influential in your life, that if you had not met them and crossed paths with them, and they had spent time with you and you with them, that maybe your life would not be the same as it is today. It's been said that in the future, you can go out, like, let's say, five years as, as your life moves along, that you'll be the same today, except in that time frame for the, the books that you read and the people that you meet. And today I want to tell you all about someone named Jesus who will change your life. And he has a book that I'm going to encourage you to be reading that tells you all about him. So we're going to be looking at who he is, what he's done and continues to do, and how he is so different from anyone else. So I want to start by telling you about his book. When we look into what can very simply be called the Jesus book, this Bible, these sacred scriptures are all about our Lord Jesus Christ. And they tell us about Jesus coming to earth to be with us. In the Old Testament, we see what's given to us for the preparation of the coming of the first coming of Jesus. And you could say, well, I don't really remember seeing Jesus' name in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament is full of pictures and examples of what Jesus is like and how we can learn from that. Jesus said himself in Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he explained how the Old Testament scriptures were about him and his future coming in time. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 that he came in the fullness of time when the time was right in God's plan to become a man and be born, live and die and provide redemption for us from our sins. And then let me skip to into the New Testament where we have in Acts the story about the propagation of the story of Jesus, how that the Great Commission, how that Jesus came so that everyone could have everlasting life, how that the the disciples at that time were encouraged to be witnesses, to spread the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost part of of the world, to let the world know that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then in the back portion of this of the scripture, we have what we call the epistles. And they are letters to churches and to God's servants explaining all about this gospel 
this understanding of how all this could be and how it can take place, not just to those people, but to us also who have obtained like precious faith. We see the story of the gospel, how that we've all fallen short of the glory of God and the wages and payment of our sin is eternal death and separation from God. But God loved us so much that he sent Jesus that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God spared not his own son, but freely delivered him up for us all. And what all that's about is that with our sin and the judgment that comes from that of disobeying, rebelling against God, Jesus came and took all of our sin on the cross and made a payment for our sin. And it could be considered a grand exchange, how that Jesus took our place and died for each one of us. And how that with that, God is satisfied that Jesus paid for our sins and Jesus had no sin. So he could do that. And with that, we can become as righteous as Jesus because of that exchange. Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin, that we could become the righteousness. We, Jesus got all of our sin, and when we meet Jesus and accept him as our Savior, we get all of Jesus' righteousness. And can you imagine? Can you understand? I can't. How could God do that? God loves us so much. And it's so wonderful, the blessing that we have from our salvation, that we have all of that blessing. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, through faith God has quickened us. Or that's an old-fashioned word for God, making us alive. And then it goes on to tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 15, that we should live not any longer unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. It's a great thing for us to get to live for Jesus because of what he's done for us. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All of this as we have met Jesus and the effect that it has on our lives and how we are able to yield ourselves and obey Jesus and follow what the Bible teaches us as far as how we live and what we do and how we think and all of our perspectives, that through all of that, that we can be a picture of Jesus, of the Jesus that we've met, so that others can find out about him, all that we can glorify God in our lives. But then we go on to the consummation story in the book of Revelation of all the things that are coming to pass in the future and the story of Jesus coming again. And it's just like the fact that all of this world, all the different things that are going on, all the problems, all the turmoil, you can think in your mind, what in the world is this world coming to with all the trouble that's there. Well, I'm here to tell you it's coming to Jesus. One day Jesus will come back and he will rule and reign on the earth. It's just like when the announcement came for Jesus the first time. And behold, talking to uh, Mary, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus, and he shall be great. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jesus is coming back to rule and reign on the earth where his righteousness will be as far as the east is from the west and cover the earth as the seas do. But then that brings us to where we're going to focus today into what can be called the manifestation of the story 
of Jesus. How that Jesus' particularly earthly, earthly life is recorded, and we can learn things about that. And it's done in, in the Gospels. And each Gospel presents Jesus in a certain perspective and emphasis. In Matthew, Jesus is emphasized as the coming King. In Mark, He's emphasized as the servant. How that He has taught that our life is all about being servants for others, just as Jesus came and was a servant for us. In Luke, His humanity is emphasized. How that He was completely human. And that's how that He could die on the cross for us. Luke chapter 17 and excuse me, chapter 19 and verse 10, for the Son of Man, the human is come, the God-man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. <coughs> Ooh, I can't do that. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe I see you nodding. I'll do that again or whatever here. But I'll, I'll try to keep it not to be that way. All right. So now we come to John, the beloved disciple. John the disciple, the one in earthly relationship that, that is referred to often as the one, the disciple who Jesus loved, the one that was closest to Jesus in a personal way, just like family, and to whom on the cross Jesus assigned the care and keeping of his mother after Jesus would be buried. So let's go to our scripture, and I want to read John chapter 1, if you can follow along with me, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same care came to bear, came for a witness to bear light excuse me, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so here's a description by John, a very special description of who Jesus is. There's all type of wide opinions on who Jesus is, but the most important thing that you'll need to know in your life, you need to come to a true and full understanding of who Jesus is. Some people that, um, that don't understand say that he's just simply, he was somebody that was a wandering rabbi. Others have said that he was a magician who influenced others through illusion and hypnosis. Uh, some people think he just was an unusual Jewish person with a flair for shrewd moral teaching. Just all types of things have been said about who Jesus is. And some folks believe Jesus isn't even a historical person, that he's just a myth that's been made up by a cult to be used to influence others. There are even people who say they are Jesus. And Jesus has warned us to be cautious to not be deluded by that. So in this, we see John's description of Jesus, and he calls Jesus the Word and emphasizes that in a great way. Jesus has other names other than Jesus. One that we know uh, very familiar with is the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to tell you about that. I'm not sure how I'm going to do All right. The Lord is his authoritative name. How that Jesus is our master. And, and for those of us that know him as our savior, he, he is 
in authority over us and we belong to him, how that we should obey him. It's easy to say that Jesus is Lord, but he, is, he himself asks the question, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Ouch. As, as our Lord, we are to obey and follow him. Jesus is his earthly name. Christ is his redemptive name, being the Messiah, the promised one sent from God, the King of the Jews, and the Savior of the world. But with this, John begins his biography with Jesus with a very, very special name, calling Jesus the Word. So it's kind of a, let's think about that for a minute. You ever stop and think, why would Jesus have a name like that? Language itself is the ability to communicate. And that itself comes from God. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Excuse, I'm sorry for my scratchy throat. To say that Jesus is the Word is God's basis to reveal Himself to us, that it envelops all that has gone, God has done to reveal Himself to us because God wants us to know Him. God wants us to know Him in such a special way. Hebrews 1.3 tells us, God who spoke at various and sundry times has in these last days spoken to us by his son. This is a way to say that Jesus is God's ultimate revelation to us, that God doesn't have any extra, anything more to come other than Jesus himself and what Jesus taught. No new books, no angels, no visions, no extra added books to the Bible. But Jesus is the ultimate revelation to us. Matthew 17, 5. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Jesus says it this way in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In our language today, that's saying that I am the A to the Z of God's revelation in all that takes place in what God wants you to know about him and how you can understand God. <coughs> now, Jesus is a way that God tells us what he is like. He's not just the thought, but he came in human flesh that we could see God in a form similar to us. You might call that a medium of manifestation. Jesus is also a means of communication. Words are vehicles of understanding and expression. What does God want to tell us? That we are lost and undone and that we are in need of salvation and a Savior in order to be able to be His children and be in fellowship with Him. Jesus was a method of revelation showing us God's wisdom and power and mercy and grace. Jesus became fully man, yet he was fully God. And what a mystery that is. Jesus did the things that God does. Jesus was God in his power. He could calm the storms on the raging sea of Galilee, just as he can calm the storms in our life. Jesus was God in his pardon. Who can forgive sins but God only? And Jesus could forgive sins. Jesus was God in his position. He was the Messiah, as we said, the long-awaited coming king. Jesus was God in his perception. Jesus knows our hearts and minds. Jesus knows our every thought. Jesus is God in power. Jesus is God in 
person. Now, I skipped my, my uh, outline if you're following in the bulletin, so let me go back and tell you that Jesus is God eternally. Before there was a cosmos, there was a Christ. Before there was, there was Jesus. Before there was a sun to shine. Before there was a moon to glow. Before there was a star to twinkle or a river to flow. There was Jesus. Other Bible verses tell us what John is talking about in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. In Colossians, one of the epistles, if we go back and look there in verse 16, it gives us some explanation when you think, well, I thought the Bible said in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, we see in Colossians, it also gives us the uh, cross-reference that Jesus was before all things in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Another translation says, for through him God created everything. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Then you could say, well, what about Bethlehem? Is it that where he was born? Yes, that's where he had his human birth, but that at all was not his beginning. The Bible tells us in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 that his goings have been from old, from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus is not only eternally God, Jesus is equally God. And there in our phrase in verse 1, and the Word was God. This is, one of, this is said to be one of the strongest statements as to the deity of Christ. How could Jesus be God? Well, it's what we call the Trinity. How that God has three persons. He is one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but in three persons. Not three gods, not three in one, not three different parts adding up to one. Not one plus one equals, plus one equals three, but more like one times one, times one equals one. The great three in one in one. We live in a Trinity modeled world. It's made up of space and time and matter. Space itself is made up of length and breadth and height. Matter is energy, motion, and substance, I'm told. Time is past, present, and future. Man is body, soul, and spirit. Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And so he did. Jesus is equally God in all the things that he did in his life. We think of things of the miracles that he's done and the stories of the Gospels. All the different ways that he has shown that he is God. Jesus said so himself, John chapter 10 and verse 30. I and my Father are one. John chapter 14 verse 9. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is essentially God. And the Word was God. All the different things that we would mention earlier in his position, his person, perception, and power. But I think his pardon is such a great thing. How that we can be forgiven of our sins. Just as Jesus was able to say to the man, that the paralytic, that was brought in through the roof that Jesus was to heal. Instead of Jesus telling him to get up and walk, he said, thy sins be forgiven you. And he was challenged with that. They said, who can do that but God? And so Jesus, proving that he was God, said, take up your bed and walk. 
forgiving him of his sins. And as with the lady taken in adultery, he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Another translation says he's the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus is essentially God. They're just, they're the same. Jesus is God's son. They look, they act, they talk, they walk. They sound just alike. Then let's look at, at what Jesus has accomplished and still doing. Jesus is the maker of creation in John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He is the cause, creation is the effect. He is the designer, and our precise universe is his handiwork. From the billions and billions of stars out that cannot be counted for the immeasurable distance of the universe and the galaxies, all things were made by him. All things is an interesting expression given in the Bible. It points out very important information. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 12, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are made new, just as in the earthly creation. <coughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All the things that Christ would have us to do to fulfill God's will. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, for we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Then Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God. What a challenge in our Christian life to give thanks for all things, even the disappointing things, even the sorrowful things, even the sad things. God teaches us to do that, that there be no bitterness in our heart as we thank and trust Him. Jesus created all things, and Jesus knew where it would lead. Holy fingers formed the bough where grew the thorns that crowned His brow. The nails that pierced the hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill upon which it stood. The sun which hid from him its face, by his decree was poised in space. The sky which darkened o'er his head, by him above the earth was spread. The spear that split his precious, spilt his precious blood, was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rocks his hands had made. Jesus created all things, and he knew that it would lead to his crucifixion, and even out of things that created, but his love for us drove him to that. By him, all things... <clears throat> were created. But not only is he the maker of creation, he's the master of creation. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 says, by him all things consist. Jesus keeps things going, the earth itself moving in three different directions all at the same time, spinning on its axis, orbiting the sun, and moving along the Milky Way through the universe. When we think of what the psalmist in Psalm 8 3 says, when I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which have ordained these things. What is man that you are mindful of him? How that Jesus has created all of those type things. Whether you look at the universe through a microscope or through a telescope, you see all the symmetry and the beauty, the harmony, the balance, the order, all in control 
all designed by Jesus that brings order and direction and purpose, as it does in our lives when we let Jesus take over control of our lives and we become a creation in him. Colossians tells us that that was all done, that Jesus might have what's called the preeminence. Let me ask you, who's preeminent in your life? Ask you a pointed question. Is it you? Many times in our lives, that's the case. It certainly can be in mine. But all of this that we are thinking about today is to remind us about Jesus and how he made our salvation possible. How that Jesus is to be preeminent in all that, that takes place in our lives. And this is how Paul says it in the book of Colossians. Verses 19 and 20. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Verse 21, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, verse 22, through death to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable. In his sight, verse 23, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Jesus is our way to God for our reconciliation. Then let me tell you how he's different from anyone else. John chapter four and uh, chapter one, verses four and five. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended him not. Life comes from God and life comes from Jesus. Only God is the giver of life. Jesus is the strength of our earthly life. Job chapter 1 verse 21, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus is the secret of our effective life. In him was life. Our spiritual life is a gift from Jesus. John 10, 10, I am come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. Only Jesus can make you the person God wants you and you ought to be. Only Jesus can be the object of our faith to live by that guarantees us heaven. Only Jesus with the secret of effective life can give us a purpose that gives life eternal meaning. And then Jesus is the source of eternal life. The age-old question could be, what happens after this life is over? Is there anything after this? The questions asked in Job chapter 14, verse 4, if a man shall die, shall he live again? Those of us that know Jesus, that have met him, we know the answer is yes. Oh, yes, there is life. He shall live again. John chapter 1, verse 11 John chapter 11, verses 25 through 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. There's all kinds of things in our life that are temporal to try to help us extend our life with fitness, nutrition, health regimen, drugs to help and heal from disease and sickness, operation to operations to correct problems, put in new parts. More and more, how that uh, it's amazing what all can be done to help us in this life. But our earthly body will only go so long. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, In the sweat of your face shall ye eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, and unto dust you shall return. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, speaking of our bodies, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. And so how do we stand before God to answer for our sin? 
Can there be anybody else that can stand in our stead and that we could tell that, that we had met or that we would call upon to help? No, no one else but Jesus. As with Peter in John chapter 6, verse 68, we could say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus is the source of eternal life. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Jesus brings life to the dead, but Jesus also brings light to the dark. The Bible tells us not or if without Jesus, without ever having met him, not only are we spiritually dead, but we're spiritually darkened. In the Bible, darkness is a picture of, of error and wickedness and sin, and wrongdoing. So, such darkness, so dark, that it's as though you're blind, and you don't know which way that you're going. And the darkness, verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There's so much darkness in the world today. The darkness of so-called science that denies Jesus. It's kind of a thing you'd think with all the things that happen with that. It's been said, I don't think I have enough faith to be an atheist. All the faith that that takes to believe the things that nothing times something equals everything. That we're here from goo by way of the zoo to you. I don't have enough faith for that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God by the faith of <coughs> Excuse me, the face of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Matthew 7 exhorts us, verses 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. People groping in spiritual darkness. They need the light of Jesus. Jesus is the light. John chapter 8 verse 12. I am the light of the world. Such a blessing that Jesus is to us. Speaking of the biography of Jesus, Thinking of him and how that he was like no one else. No one else is like him. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village. The child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. And then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He had nothing to do with this world except the naked power of his divine manhood. While he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. He was turned over to his enemies he went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth while he was dying. And that was his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a barred grave through the pity of a friend. Such was his human life. He rises from the dead. And 19 wide centuries have come and gone today. He is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. I say that all the armies that ever marched and all the navies that were ever built and all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as Jesus. Jesus, what an important the most important person ever we could know. Have you met Jesus? 
John tells us that he is God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. God spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all that we could be saved. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. He's gone up to heaven and is coming again to receive us unto ourselves. Maybe we could say with Thomas, when he saw Jesus after he was risen again with the nail prints and his side, my Lord and my God, Jesus is, is, is your creator. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, And may we say with the twenty elders, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, even me, and for your pleasure. They and we are and were created. Jesus is your life and your light. Psalm 1611, You will show me the path of light. 1 John 1, 5, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. I invite you today to meet Jesus. You say, well, how do you meet him? Isn't he in heaven? You meet Jesus by faith, by accepting him, by accepting his word. You invite him into your heart. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door in the knock and knock. The way that you invite Jesus into your heart is you admit your sin, that you are a sinner. The Bible tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You acknowledge the sacrifice that Jesus made in your place. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, But God committed this love toward us while we were yet sinners. Jesus died for us. You abandon your self-effort. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His grace as He saved us. And then you accept Jesus as your substitute, as your Savior, as your Redeemer. John chapter 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The spouse for prayer. <clears throat> I want to ask Linda to pause while we're thinking on these things. Knowing Jesus is not a creed that you just believe in certain things. Knowing Jesus is not a code that you live by, that if I'm good enough, that I'll go to heaven. Knowing Jesus is not a cause, just trying to be good and trying to help others. There's no way today to be saved by all these various plans. You might call them plans of salvation. You're not saved by trying to do those plans by your own works. Not saved by those plans of salvation, you're saved by meeting the man of salvation, Jesus Christ. Not by believing something, but by receiving someone, by meeting Jesus and asking him into your heart. Placing faith in his word that he does forgive you and one day will give you a home in heaven. So if that would be your desire today to meet Jesus, let me lead you in a prayer. You can say in your heart, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for me. I banned my efforts. I know I can't be good enough to go to heaven. But Jesus is 
perfect and sinless, and I accept him as my substitute and my sacrifice. And Lord, thank you for forgiving me. I now accept him as my Savior and take his righteousness into my life to live out for him. And that's how you meet Jesus. Take him into your heart and he'll change your life. For those of us that have already done that, let me encourage you that we grow in our fellowship with the Lord, with all the different things that, that, that we're encouraged in in our lives, that we would study his word, we would fellowship together. Oh Lord, may we know you more. Guide us in our desire to do that. Thank you for wanting to know us, to provide Jesus as our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you to stand. If you'd like to take a moment just to reflect.